Saturday, April 2nd, 2022. I'm Jared Halpert. Russia backtracks in Ukraine. We have seen uh, that this uh, invasion has been a strategic failure uh, for Putin and for Russia. And President Biden taps the emergency oil reserves to combat rising gas prices. And the bottom line is if we want lower gas prices, we need to have more oil supply right now. This is the Fox News Rundown from Washington. News has to travel fast, but hiring often takes longer than expected. Don't let the search for the best candidates slow down your growth. Find quality candidates fast with Indeed. If you're hiring, you need Indeed, because Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. And Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements, or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find the candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Indeed partners with you on every step of the hiring process. Find great talent through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. With virtual interviews, Indeed saves you time. You can message, schedule, and interview top talent seamlessly, all in one place. No downloads, plugins, or purchases. You can do it all in one place with Indeed. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your post at Indeed.com slash Fox News. Offer valid through April 30th. Go to Indeed.com slash Fox News to claim your $75 credit before April 30th. Indeed.com slash Fox News. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. The White House is calling Russia's invasion of Ukraine a strategic blunder, even if that is being kept from Russian President Vladimir Putin. We have seen uh, that this uh, invasion has been a strategic failure uh, for Putin and for Russia. They are uh, working to redefine uh, the intentional, the the, um, uh, initial, I should say, the initial aims uh, of their invasion. That's White House Communications Director Kate Bedingfield. She answered questions this week about a declassified intelligence report suggesting close advisors to President Putin are not giving him the most accurate information about the country's war effort or the sanctions targeting the Russian economy. We have information that Putin felt misled by the Russian military, which has resulted in persistent tension between Putin and his military leadership. We believe that Putin is being misinformed by his advisors about how badly the Russian military is performing and how the Russian economy is being crippled by sanctions because his senior advisors are too afraid to tell him the truth. President Biden told reporters Putin seems to be self-isolating. And there's some indication that he has um, fired or put under house arrest some of his advisors. Rebecca Grant is a Fox News contributor providing analysis on Russia's invasion. She is the president of Iris Independent Research, specializing in defense and aerospace research with a Ph.D. in international relations from the London School of Economics. I asked her to offer her assessment of this conflict six weeks into the invasion. Now, two interesting points. One, they're saying that the defense officials are reluctant to tell Putin that he's losing and they're reluctant to tell Putin how hard sanctions are hitting the Russian people. But ask yourself, why did this leak come out? To me, it's part of a really pretty clever campaign by the White House that's gone on since January to drop in specialized intelligence. And that tells Putin we're reading his mail and that we can see what's going on behind the scenes. I think this is another one of those leaks. I would not go so far as to say that Putin doesn't have control of his military forces and doesn't know what's going on. I think it's part of their canny info ops campaign coming from the White House. And when the White House says this and President Biden says this, that's going to make news around the world. So this is going to get to to Russian leadership. Does it get to the Russian people? I'm not sure. Yes, making news around the world. That's the point to get to the Russian leadership and maybe to the Russian people for whatever reason The State Department and White House seem really keen to try to reach the Russian people, either in speeches or with these info ops leaks. Well, so it brings a bigger question, though, right, about the Russian military campaign. And you've talked about the intelligence. And, you know, for months, the White House was warning, listen, 
Russia's going to invade. They've got this troop buildup. Even when Ukraine's president was like, well, we, we're not so sure about this. It seemed like the U.S. intelligence was pretty solid on what the Russian plan was here. We were also uh, under the impression from intelligence officials that you know, the cities of Kiev, these major metropolitan areas, could fall maybe in a matter of days. Here we are six weeks into the war. Russian forces, um, I don't want to say are in retreat, but clearly stalled, stymied. What did we get wrong about the Russian military or did we get anything wrong from an intelligence standpoint about the Russian military? And no question, Ukraine has won round one by stalling that offensive around Kiev. Here's what happened to the Russians. They outran their ability to command and control, to talk to each of those tanks going down the highway towards Kiev. They have a very stodgy military doctrine that requires them to keep in close touch and wait for someone to say, hey, go to the next intersection. Second problem, they failed to take that airport on the outskirts of Kiev. They didn't put enough forces in there at first. When they lost that, there went the plan to fly in more troops and tanks and all of that and really hold Kiev. So it's happened many times in history. The Ludendorff Offensive of 1918, Battle of the Bulge, Anlock in 1972. This was a maneuver force that failed to reach its objectives and got caught out and stuck on the defensive, which was great. So has Western intelligence overestimated the Russian military? Uh, what, what are we supposed to take away here from, from this performance up to this point? I think Western intelligence believed Russia's own propaganda a little bit, that they had this great hybrid war model and could move quickly, when in reality, you know, the Russians aren't great warriors. They're just very tenacious. If we'd gone back to the Cold War military doctrine, which was tight control, we might have anticipated that they would run into these problems. At the same time, we have seen the destruction of cities like Mariupol and, and along especially the eastern and southern coast of, of um, Ukraine. And we don't want to underestimate that. Does that give you a sense now as the Pentagon has warned, listen, they're not in withdrawal. We think this is a redeployment. Does that tell you what the next phase of this looks like? And beyond that, maybe where these I know that there's been peace negotiations or ceasefire negotiations in Istanbul. So give us a clearer picture about what that may look like. Well, Putin still has several vicious options left. That's the other side of Russian military doctrine. It's firepower. We saw this in World War II. We've seen it much more recently in Grozny and in Syria, in, Syria, yeah. in Aleppo, exactly. So uh, the Pentagon tells us Russia still has the vast majority of its bomb and missile inventory, and I'm afraid they can continue to strike those cities. Heck, they are still hitting Kiev. I believe the Pentagon, when they say they see Russia repositioning, the question now, to my mind, I think Ukraine has the initiative with its counterattacks at Kherson and other places. So what will Putin do? Where will he decide to defend? And a big question in my mind, of course, is about Mariupol. Will that become the next big battle in this vicious and brutal war? Is that a strategic, is that for strategy? I mean, it's on the coast. Is that a strategic get for Russia? It looks like Mariupol is a strategic objective for Russia, which is why they're pounding it in the horrible, horrible mm -hmm. destruction there. It had been hit in the 2014-2015 phase okay. of the war as That initial well. annexation of Crimea. In the initial yeah. annexation. And remember, Mariupol is actually in the Donetsk uh, province. Okay. So I think Putin would like to get Mariupol in order to have what he's declared as the People's Republic of Donetsk by the same token. Ukraine would really like to hold that and keep that split between the eastern and the southern flanks of Russia's forces. As this continues, and we've talked about now we're six weeks in, it's hard to tell maybe how long this war lasts. Does that change the strategy from the White House uh, of NATO? Um, how has that played out? Is that having any impact on the decision making of the Russians, of the Ukrainians? I don't think the White House had a strategy for a war that's gone on this long the White House needs to decide to intensify its support for Ukraine, and NATO needs to come along with this as well. 
the length of the war. That will depend on the battlefield and on whether there are any negotiations that make real progress. But remember, Zelensky has said he won't give up territory. Right. And as long as Ukraine is successful on the battlefield, it looks like Ukraine's people are willing to fight it out. I think they should wait till they kick every Russian out of that country. Let me finish with this because it has been a conversation here in Washington as well. These Polish MiG fighter jets. Does that make a strategic difference for Ukraine? Maybe not, but I think that those MiGs should have gone to Ukraine because Ukraine asked and Poland could use fresh F-16s and F-35s in their place. That would have been easy to do. I wish they'd still do it. We'll see. I appreciate the, the insight, the, the strategy. I think that's important because, to your point, this war maybe is going on longer than a lot of folks here in Washington thought that it might. Yes, no question. And we want to see Ukraine win. You know, if Ukraine wins and defeats Russia on the battlefield, Europe and the world will be safer for a generation. That's the outcome I want to see. We'll uh, continue to follow the story. Rebecca, thank you so much. Thank you. Download Fox News Channel's The Five podcast for free. Five of your favorite Fox News personalities discuss current issues in a roundtable discussion. Get it now on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and foxnewspodcasts.com. Do you have a rainy day fund? Do you know an account out of sight, out of mind, until you absolutely need it? And when is it rainy enough to tap into it? When is uncertainty more than that and instead an emergency? When it comes to gas prices, maybe we're there. The Biden administration is tapping into a rainy day fund of sorts in an effort to stabilize gas prices. The president announced this week a historic release of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Up to 180 million barrels of oil over six months. A million barrels of additional product every day. Our prices are rising because of Putin's action. There isn't enough supply. And the bottom line is, if we want lower gas prices, we need to have more oil supply right now. President Biden has pointed to the Russian invasion of Ukraine for spiking oil prices that were already on the rise as pandemic shutdowns ended and demand for gasoline and other petroleum products increased. This is the third release of oil from the Strategic Reserve, the first two done in coordination with other allies, first in November and then at the start of the war in Ukraine. This time it's sustained in a much larger U.S. contribution. How much will prices drop and how quickly? Fox News White House correspondent Jackie Heinrich has been pressing the president and administration officials. Well, the White House believes that this is going to cause prices to come down um, because they are injecting uh, a million barrels a day into the marketplace over time. The last two times they released supply from the country's emergency reserves, there was not a measurable impact on gas prices. But because this is going to be sustained over a period of time, they think it's going to uh, eventually bring down prices. The president ballparked potentially somewhere between 10 and 30 cents. Uh, but officials were uh, broadly not wanting to make any guesstimates um, or especially on when Americans might be able to see this, uh, their prices go down. You know, this is an interesting move on their part because it doesn't do anything to resolve the deficit in the market. And some analysts think that over time, you know, you've got this prolonged structural deficit and then you're releasing reserves, barrels from the reserves in a time of supply uncertainty. And that could ultimately potentially keep prices high. Um, At the same time, they're calling for, uh, you know, an investment in green energy and the president at the same time as making this announcement about releasing the barrels invoked the Defense Production Act in order to make electric vehicle batteries here in the U.S. Um, So they're doing this sort of two-pronged approach. But when this is all finished, when the reserves have been released, uh, it will be depleted by a third, which will be the lowest level since 1984. The White House says they plan to replenish that emergency supply in the coming years when supply is up and prices are down. But if they're not doing anything to encourage production except for you know, slapping companies with fines if they have unused wells and unused leases. They're not really um, creating more energy-friendly policies that would bolster production broadly. I have a lot of questions about about that uh, strategy, but let me start with uh, 
Uh, one more about the, the the strategic petroleum reserve here is we said this was the third time since November uh, that the Biden administration has done this. The previous two times it was done uh, in coordination with other countries. The idea being let's boost the overall global supply of oil. Obviously, gas prices, the oil market are, are not you know, narrow enough for just the U.S. It is a global market, a global supply. Are other countries joining the administration here and tapping their reserves this time around? Uh, the administration says they are pushing other countries to release reserves in tandem with our release. They would not give any sort of clues about which countries might be doing that. There was going to be a meeting in Paris today uh, broadly to, to, to talk about that. I think that, you know, they're expecting that other countries will, but we just haven't been given a whole lot of details yet. Okay. So it obviously, you know, is a broader discussion, a longer term debate here about U.S. energy policy. And you point out that the uh, Republican critics that uh, energy uh, industry folks say that they need more certainty here from the administration. Now, Now, the Biden administration has said, listen, there are a lot of leases here that are going unused. Why isn't that incentive for these companies? Well, it's it, there's a, a number of different things that are, you know, keeping companies fr- at their, you know, lower than pre-pandemic levels. One being a lot of these leases, uh, you don't necessarily know if there's energy underneath the ground uh, mm-hmm. when you get the lease. I mean, it's basically a right for future development. Then there's a permitting process uh, that has to go through various agencies. A lot of the permitting processes are redundant, have to, you know, do an environmental review sometimes through multiple agencies before they can get, you know, right of way and, you know, other various licenses that are necessary. Capital is also a problem because a lot of these companies are having a hard time getting, you know, loans, lending, um, given the fact that the administration wants to move away from fossil fuels. They've made no qualms about that. And so, you know, if, if you are, if you're a lender, why would you be, you know, putting your money into something that could, you know, end up with a loss? I mean, look at look at the Keystone Pipeline, for instance. They lost a ton of money on that. So it's 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 sort of hedging, right? We don't know what the the marketplace for for fossil fuels looks like three, five, ten years down the road. Right. So. The president also, did he invoke, he's asking to invoke the Defense Production Act when it comes to, to uh, building sort of EV components. What, what is the, the strategy? What does that do? What's the timeline look like? How's this implemented? A lot of questions about that part of this uh, part of the speech. Sure. So large capacity batteries are critical to electric vehicle production. There are a lot of components that go into them, including uh, lithium, nickel, cobalt, graphite, manganese. Um, A lot of these minerals are, you know, oftentimes coming from places like China. Um, So we're trying, the the U.S. government is trying to basically inject money uh, into the industry here in the U.S. That's that's what the Defense Production Act does, is it gives federal funding, basically, uh, because there is, these companies are being compelled to produce more of these elements um, so that we can get those components that are necessary for electric vehicles uh, to be coming from the U.S. rather than shifting dependence on, you know, Russian oil, for instance, to Chinese battery parts. And so this is obviously something that that's long term, right? I mean, it's not as if this type of operation can ramp up during the six months that we're releasing oil from the, the strategic reserves. Certainly not. And, uh, you know, a lot of these long term, um, you know, moves to sort of shift away from reliance on foreign sources, um, it's, it's going to take a long time. I mean, on the chips issue, which, which is a separate issue, but it's, yeah. you know, another sort of microcosm of this. Um, you know, we rely on semiconductors coming from other countries, coming from China, China uh, yeah. coming from Taiwan, which who knows how the, you know, the future of that's going to go. Right. And so there's an, there's an initiative now to build a giant plant in Ohio. It's going to take five years plus for that to really get underway. Um, and in the meantime, a lot of different things could happen. We were already facing a uh, shortage of semiconductor chips, um, which has impacted everything from, you know, cars available on the market to uh, replacement parts for, for electronics and so on. So we're, we're realizing that over time we've shifted manufacturing out of this country and now we are 
at a, a point where we're trying to bring it, some of it back home, but it cannot happen overnight. I mean, is this this isn't just because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but it, it seems to me, and I'm curious what your reporting would indicate, that the invasion of Ukraine by Russia perhaps put in focus uh, the the problem with some of these supply chain issues. I think that the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine certainly highlighted, mm-hmm. you know, the, the issues that we have with dependence on foreign oil and gas um, and that, that our allies have on foreign oil and gas. I mean, you have these sweeping sanctions fr- coming from the U.S. and coming for our, from our allies. Right now, you know, the, the ruble has hit almost its pre-pandemic or pre-war um, levels. And a lot of that is the Russian government is artificially propping up the ruble. But what's not happening is these sanctions have a loophole for energy transactions. Right. So, and, and, the and that's because countries US like Germany and, and elsewhere oil, but, in Europe you know, are so the dependent. The EU has not done that yet. Yeah. So until and unless there is that, you know, shift um, to to block and and sanction energy transactions, that's going to act as a floor for Russia's uh, economy. On the other issues, when it comes to, you know, manufacturing, I think that that's been a little bit more in focus for a longer time because we've been in, you know, in, I don't want to say adversarial relationship, but certainly a competitive relationship with China um, and one that is worrisome when, you know, they're telling you, for instance, back off of Taiwan, don't get any ideas here about um you know, defending them. If we if we end up wanting to make a move, how would you like it if you didn't have any pharmaceuticals in the U.S.? I mean, there are a lot of different industries that we depend on China for, and so there's a broad push to bring some of that back home. What's the uh, timeline here that the White House sees in, in trying to sort of stabilize the oil market? Well, they won't give any timeline, I think, because, you know, if they do, they're just sort of damned if they do and damned if they don't, because if they give one and then it doesn't end up bearing out, yeah. um, you know, that, that that's not great for them. Um, and also, it's tough to... I mean, it's tough to predict. It's tough to predict. Yeah. Right? Because it's yeah, a global exactly. market. Yeah. Exactly. And you've had also, you know, they've been pushing OPEC to ramp up production. Those calls have fallen on deaf ears. They've, you know, decided to pretty much keep supply stable, um, you know, so that's gone nowhere. And then Biden has been making calls to, you know, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, so on. Um, but it has not produced anything tangible. And as we've seen, you know, gas prices have continued to go up. Yeah. All right. I'll finish with this off topic, but some reporting that you were able to confirm here uh, late this week about uh, the future of the press secretary, Jen Psaki. It sounds like uh, in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, you'll be asking your questions to someone new. What, what's this uh, reporting you can share? So we have confirmed from a, a source familiar with the situation that Jen Psaki will be leaving her post here at the White House in the coming weeks, sometime this spring. She's going to be taking a job at MSNBC. Uh, I was told that there was a bidding war between CNN and MSNBC to get her on board. There are some, you know, legal stipulations about how she has to go go about her departure um, and, and contract signing mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, federal ethics rules. So she wants to be, you know, have her I's dotted and T's crossed on that front. But we do know she's going to be leaving. There have been some reports from other outlets, which I don't have the details on, but Axios, for instance, reported that uh, she's going to be taking a, a show on Peacock, which is their streaming service, and then would also um, you know, lend her voice to, to programming on, on the cable channel during the day as well. The timing of the departure is not a big surprise, right? Jen's kind of talked about not being on board for for the full first term, right? Yeah, she we've known, you know, for a while that she was going to head out. I think it was, you know, pretty much soon after she got into this job that the expectation was that she would do it for a year. Um, you know, she was out of government before this, mm-hmm. um, after having been in government for the you know, Obama administration. So she sort of came back to this government job and didn't plan on staying in it long term. And a year is, you know, it's a good run for a press secretary. We don't know who's going to follow her up, but we are we're waiting to see. <laughs> They've almost been auditioning the last couple of weeks, so we'll, we'll stay tuned for that. Uh, yeah. Jackie, appreciate the, appreciate the reporting as always. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Jared. You too.
tomorrow on the Fox News Rundown from Washington. It was a busy week for the January 6th committee, the House panel investigating last year's Capitol riot. Congressional correspondent Chad Pergram shares his reporting on the questions being asked and when lawmakers could provide answers. And Jessica Rosenthal sits down with a Wyoming political reporter to chat about Congresswoman Liz Cheney's Republican primary challenge. Until then, I'm Jared Halpern. Thanks for listening to the Fox News Rundown from Washington. Download Fox News Channel's The Five podcast for free. Five of your favorite Fox News personalities discuss current issues in a roundtable discussion. Get it now on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and foxnewspodcasts.com.